The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also, and also with you. O come, O offshoot of Jesse's line, restore, restore the fruitfulness of your people. Almighty God, you brought forth a royal branch from the ancient stock of Jesse's line. Grant that we who have been grafted into this heritage may bear fruit worthy of Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be seated for the lessons. Our first reading comes from the book of Isaiah. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our enemy. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What did we hear? That you won't remember our iniquity forever. Mm. Others. There's a, a lot of debate in the scholarship about how to divide up the book of Isaiah in terms of who authored it, because it seems to be at least two, if not three, or more divisions in the book. And um, so by one reckoning, this might be the kind of third section. And um, one thing that I, I read this week suggested that uh, it comes out of a time of crisis between the people who had been left behind during the exile and the people that were coming back after the Babylonian exile. And it created this kind of crisis about sort of who's in charge of the temple anyway right now, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, other thoughts?
Okay, well, let us uh, continue with Psalm number 80, which is on page 4. <clears throat> did you hear? I find it an interesting juxtaposition to the first reading, because the first reading sounds like they felt abandoned, and, right. and, and they thought it was God was angry with them. And this reading is giving them comfort, giving someone comfort, the mm -hmm. Corinthians, obviously, but yeah. it could be, it, it's someone saying, no, God will strengthen you, God is with you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of like a mm -hmm. feel-good kind of speech. Mm -hmm. Too bad that they didn't hear this when they were feeling so abandoned. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think too. I, I just hear that Paul's gratitude for kind of the fruit of his labor. Uh -huh. You know, the sense of, of you know that he see in in the Christians, you know, that just God's grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, part of bringing the gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's... Maybe there's a bit of an attention in this as well, because uh, the writer seems to be. 
be saying to whoever is listening, you, you people have it all together. And yet, what he's reminding them of is that um, it's all about what is yet to happen. Their orientation is toward the future, not dwelling on the glories of the present moment. Let us stand to greet the gospel.
for me has been an extraordinary experience. And I love what a lot of Anglicans often say, you know, come to Anglican Church, you don't have to leave your brain at the door, right? You've heard this before. And it's true. And uh, I want to also thank Father Tate for welcoming here, me here. Um, I think I think we're fellow Americans. You're, you're an American. Where are you from? Lots of places. <laughs> uh, born in Seattle, raised mostly in the Midwest, spent some time in New Jersey, Virginia, Los Angeles, New Connecticut. Jersey, well, that's probably where we're kind of in now. It's a beautiful state. Uh, uh, I am from South Carolina, on the other hand. Uh, also a beautiful state. Uh, South Carolina, um, we like to secede a lot from things. We began the, uh, began the Civil War, of course, which they call the War of Northern Aggression. Uh, the Episcopal Church actually seceded there recently over uh, issues and debates. Uh, and South Carolina, unfortunately, is sometimes the second worst state for things like education, health care, uh, all kinds of other things. It's usually the second worst. So South Carolina's state motto is thank God for Alabama. Um, <laughs> I'm from Greenville, uh, Greenville, South Carolina. And this past year, uh, and, and one thing you have to know about Greenville, South Carolina, is that Greenville is basically the buckle of the Bible Belt. I mean, you know the Bible Belt. This is the buckle of the Bible Belt. And so the Christianity or the expression of Christianity there tends to be very literalist, literal, fundamentalist kind of approach uh, to the Word of God. Uh, and it's interesting. The people are lovely. The people are welcoming. The people are good. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a different kind of Christianity that's practiced there. What's interesting was this past summer, on August 21st, actually at 2.38 p.m. to be exact, in Greenville, South Carolina, there was an experience of the total solar eclipse. You all remember that? We got a partial expression of the, of the solar, solar eclipse here, but there was absolutely total. Uh, and in fact, Greenville, South Carolina, my hometown, was advertised on national news as one of the best places to view this total solar eclipse. In fact, all the hotels were booked, uh, and a lot of the private residences started doing Airbnbs for, uh, for their rooms because people were paying $300, $400, $500 a night to stay at just you know, a regular hotel so they could see this momentous astrological, astronomical event of a total solar eclipse. And it was interesting because after the total solar eclipse, and you can check this out on Google, there were lots and lots of articles, there were lots and lots of talk about the end of the world. Because the total solar eclipse in the scriptures has often been seen as a sign or as a portent of some looming thing to come. And in fact, that's what we hear uh, in the gospel today. And not only was there a total solar eclipse, but if you remember, and these days it's hard to remember what was going on in the news last week, let alone a few months ago, but right after the total solar eclipse, there was a major hurricane that devastated Houston, that flooded Houston to biblical proportions. There were hurricanes also, of course, in the Atlantic and the Caribbean. There was a hurricane that knocked out power to Puerto Rico. I don't know if Puerto Rico still has power. There were fire, fire, uh, fires, forest fires out in California, out in Napa Valley, in the wine country. And then, of course, there were wars and rumors of wars, anyway. Rumors of wars on Twitter with North Korea, the threat that North Korea faced, uh, presented. And there were all these other things that were going on. So people were saying, is this the end of the world? Are these signs a sign that Jesus is about to come? Are these signs indicative that the second coming is upon us? Watch, watch. Know what it's like for the fig tree. When the fig tree is bearing its blossoms, we know that spring is near. The Bible certainly seems to encourage us to look at the signs of the times and to see if the signs of the times tell us something about the second coming of Jesus. And certainly in South Carolina, where I'm from, a lot of those who took a literalistic, fundamentalist, apocalyptic version of the scripture certainly kind of bought into this. Jesus is coming! Look busy. Jesus is coming. <laughs> Look busy. You know, whether 
Jesus is coming or not, and, and lots of people have made lots of money trying to predict when Jesus is coming, to the day and to the hour. We call these people usually charlatans because the scripture tells us that no one knows, not even the Son knows, of the time when he will return. But it is the season of Advent, the season that we are in now. The season, in fact, that gets its name from the word coming, Advent, coming, that we look into our own lives for the presence, the arrival, the coming of Jesus Christ. We don't have to necessarily be Nostradamus like doomsday waiters and watchers to want to experience the presence of the coming of Christ in our lives. And the season of Advent is the time to do that, to watch, to be prepared, to take stock of our lives and to ask ourselves, are we listening? Are we awake? Are we paying attention to the signs around us of God's presence? Historically, when we've talked about Advent in the church, we've talked about different comings of Jesus. Certainly, we and most people know that Advent is a preparation for the coming of Jesus at Christmas, an historical coming, a coming that happened roughly 2015, 2017 years ago, roughly, that we celebrate the coming of the birth of the baby Jesus. That's one of the comings we celebrate. The other one, though, of course, is this future coming of the Lord in clouds and glory and thunder. But there's another coming that has been an historical understanding of how we approach the season of Advent. And it's the coming of the Lord that can be described as the in-between coming, the coming that is in between the first historical coming many millennia ago and the coming at some point of the Lord in glory in the future. There is an in-between coming which is where we spend our lives. Between these two points or poles, this is where we spend our lives. And so the question is, how is Jesus coming to us now, in our lives, here and now, in our relationships, in our events, in things that we experience? I think as we come to celebrate this liturgy, we're experiencing the coming of the Lord in several ways. First, in his word that we've just heard proclaimed, Secondly, in the sacraments, especially the Eucharist that we're about to celebrate. And thirdly, in our relationships, in the events of our lives, in the things that come upon us and what we experience. I just want to say something briefly about each one. First, Jesus comes to us in his word. What does it mean when someone gives you his or her word? It means they're trying to establish a relationship of trust with you. You can trust me. You can count on me. I will be there for you. I will do what I say. Also, when someone gives you their word, it means that they want to communicate with you. That they want to communicate with you in order to be in communion with you. To communicate with you, to establish a relationship with you. And this is what I think of when I think of Jesus coming to us in his word. That he's given us word, his word so that we can enter into a relationship with him. And so that we can know that we can trust him with our lives. Secondly, Jesus comes in the sacraments. All the sacraments. But I think especially the Eucharist, which is why we come back here Sunday after Sunday, to celebrate this coming of the Lord Jesus in this bread and wine that he gives us. To remember that time in which he gave himself to us on the cross, in which he gave his life, in which he poured out his blood, in which his body was broken, for us, that that is remembered, that that is celebrated. And once again, and once again, Jesus gives to us his body, his blood, and his presence to be with us and to enter into communion with us. And finally, I think Jesus comes to us in those relationships that we have, especially, especially the relationships that are hard, especially the relationships that take work and that take effort. Those relationships where we know that we need to love someone, but it's not as easy as we would like it to be sometimes. And in all of these different ways that Jesus is coming to us, in his word, in the sacraments, in the Eucharist, in relationships with people, in the events of our lives, Jesus is teaching us something about love. Because love 
is understood in the Gospels. Not so much as a feeling, not so much as a sentiment, but as an action, as an action of gift. That I am, if I love you, I am giving myself for you. I am giving something of myself for you. This is the mystery of the cross, isn't it? Jesus gives himself for us. This is what it is to give us his word. Jesus wants to enter into a relationship with us. There's always, when we talk about love, this thing about giving. Because what is the greatest form of love? What is the highest form of love? No one has greater love than this then, to give your life for another. Love is always inextricably tied to give it, to give it. And it's love that in the midst of a world that is passing away, in the midst of a world that is uncertain, in the midst of a world that can be threatened by disasters that are natural and disasters that are not so natural, I'm thinking of somebody's Twitter account, <laughs> that in the midst of all this uncertainty and change, that the one thing that remains is love. Our second lesson today was from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and I I'm not going to quote from that, but I would like to quote from something later on he said in the same letter to the church at Corinth. And it's actually one of the most familiar lines from 1 Corinthians. It's something we hear at weddings a lot. And it goes like this. Love bears all things. Heard of this? Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never as for prophecies, they will pass away. Love never ends. As for tongues, they will cease. Love never ends. As for knowledge, it will pass away. But love never ends. And this is love that God has first loved us. God has first given himself for us. And so part of this Christian journey that we have is recognizing God's generosity in the very first place to us. And taking the time to be awake. Because it's very, very hard today to be awake. We live in a culture of distraction. Most of us, myself included, cannot get through a meal in a restaurant without checking their smartphones. We can't do it. We're distracted. Our attention span becomes ever more limited as more technology comes out. And this is a burden for us because it prevents us from being awake and from realizing what's going around us and what's going on inside of us and how God is revealing himself to us now, how God is showing us his love for us now, of how God is manifesting his generosity to us now. <coughs> And so our prayer, one of our prayers today as we celebrate this Eucharist, is that in a world of distraction, in a world that is passing away, we might be awake. <clears throat> we might be awake to watch and to see the new thing that God is doing for us in our lives. And as we perceive his generosity all around us, and as we see how God surprises us with his love, a love that really indeed surpasses our imagination. A love that indeed no eye has seen or ear has heard. When we really understand that, it's only then that we can respond to love with love. That as God has made his life a gift for us, that we might make our lives a gift for him. Now, uh, as I conclude, I just want to say that um, I haven't preached for uh, a year and a half since I've left my Catholic pulpit. Um, and when Father Tay invited me, he said, now I just want to let you know there will be comments afterwards. <laughs> so I've been a bit nervous about this all week. But, uh, 
respecting the local culture. <laughs> I am not open for questions and comments. This just comes up. Yeah, just pull down. I think that's the thing, love is hard, right? But it's worthwhile, but real love is, is tough. Right? Thanks, um, thanks Jennifer. That it totally brought something up for me too, because I'm also a busy person. I'm a, you know, it's busyness all the time. I work ridiculous numbers of hours in a day, and um, I've recently become sort of more aware of how busyness is a temptation. It's a temptation that um, you know, it gives you this kind of counterfeit <laughs> sense of, of satisfaction, and uh, and it's not, but it's not real. And and the thing that you really, really desire is love, and uh, and the, the the search for that can make you this busy person running around trying to do things, and uh, and really what you need to do is stop, is stop being busy, and uh, and pay attention to the relationships that are around you. Yeah. Yeah, Martha and Mary, right? <laughs> say is when we talk about God, I mean I began right in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, that that God is not a person, only one person. God is a community of three persons. So before the creation of the world, even before the Big Bang, God is a community of three persons. And what are those three persons doing? They are in a relationship of perfect love. The Father from all eternity giving himself to the Son. The Son receiving the Father's love and giving himself back to the Father in their relationship of love. Their relationship of love also has a name. We call it the Holy Spirit. The Father and Son are loving one another in the unity of the Holy Spirit, which is why we sign ourselves when we sign ourselves or 
when we say in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the name of love, this community. The Greeks call it the perichoresis, uh, the Greek church, a perichoresis, which means a dance of love. A dance of love. This is who God is. This is the God we worship. We worship a dance of love, not just this some dude out in the sky who's waiting to judge us. We worship the dance of love. I think if we had advertised our churches that way, it would probably get more people. We worship the dance of love. Dancing is frowned upon in South Carolina. <laughs> St. Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, a monk in the 12th century, was actually one of the first ones to talk about the in-between coming, uh, between the first coming and the second of the final coming. So, um, these have been recycled for a thousand years, but they're always new, they're always relevant. So if the world was created through God, and because the world was created through God, then obviously it's going to bear the fingerprints, so to speak. <clears throat> the 
coming of God in Christ is to recognize that the first coming culminated in the greatest gift of love. But it wasn't recognized as that uh, by the world. The world thought, saw it and thought, well, this is a problem that has been now been resolved. When the world finally recognizes it as for what it is, that will be the second coming. In the meantime, uh, the world needs to see that that is, that what first coming was the gift of love. And the only way to see that is in the people who follow Jesus. One of the uh, observations of Gerard is that the, the risen Jesus never appeared in glory to the world. The only people who ever saw the risen Jesus were the people who were already hooked. Um, and this was their empowerment to become the sign that the, the crucified was the gift of love, by being the gift of love themselves. Thank you. I was at something on uh, Saturday, a, a workshop, and uh, we were asked uh, to discuss the small groups, uh, what is the mission of the church? And I got in a debate in my group because there was a, a very well educated man who was in that group uh, who uh, wanted to say the mission of the church is organized witness. Organized <laughs> witness. And to me, that was insufficient uh, mission. And I said, the reason it's insufficient is, first of all, it frames the sort of whole Christian endeavor as one that's primarily oriented around ethics. And, well, we could do that all day long with anything. You know, we could talk about school as being organized witness or, or any other kind of human endeavor. Like, everybody wants to be. Aristotle would say that, but what, what's different about Christianity is Christ, and kind of moving toward a crisis Christianity is problematic. So, you know, as you, as you say, John, you know, that to have um, that Christ be a very emblematic example of, of what this new love looks like is exactly something that we need to point to, and, and becomes that coming about in the world, and specific revelation, not kind of general witness, but very specific revelation that we're called to, to emulate. You guys have been really nice, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to have that for one more Sunday. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> Just one more, though. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm kind of excited about the, the notion of doing kind of a two-part, you know. And do you want to give us a sneak peek or, or, or anything about the... We just have to come and see. No, you have to come show up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be amazing, obviously. Um, no, I mean, I, I just... So what I wanted to do today is I wanted to kind of lay some more in work and talk about um, the nature of God is love and, and God. So there's this there's this understanding that act follows being, that we act the way that we are. Um, and God acts in love. God reaches out to the world in love because God is love. And God has created us in God's image and God's likeness, which means that God has created us in the image and likeness of love. And that we are only fully fulfilled when we do acts of love. In other words, it's doing acts of love, acts of generosity, acts of giving ourselves to others, acts of making our lives a gift, that that itself, at the end of the day, makes us happy. Because it's what makes us fulfilled. Because it's then that we image God in the world. And we're going to follow that theme. Imaging God in the world uh, in this understanding of, of how we also not only receive the coming of, of God in Christ, but that we we become that coming for other people as we image God and his love for them. Thank you very much. Looking forward to next week as well.
Let's rise and proclaim our faith together using the ancient words that had seen previous is our day six. Let's confess our faith as we say. We trust in one God, the Father of the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We trust in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We trust in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We trust in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In joyful expectation, let us pray to the branch of Jesse, our Savior and Redeemer, saying in response to Lord Jesus, Come soon. Branch of Jesse, each year we celebrate your coming into the world to live and die as one of us in order to restore a relationship with God, which we lost when we chose to follow our own way. You lived a life which we could not live and died a horrible death in order to bring us back to God. Lord, you reign over all things to the ends of the earth. Come and teach us how to live. Lord Jesus, come, come soon. Branch of Jesse, you healed the sick and comforted the afflicted. We pray for all those who are living with cancer or any other disease. We pray especially for Daniel, who is part of this community for Susan, who is extremely fearful. We pray for all those known to us who are in any sort of trouble, that you will show them a way out of their distress. Thank you for the grace that you so freely give us, and for your mercy, Lord. Lord Jesus, come, come soon. Branch of Jesse, you are pure love. Help us not only to receive that love, but to be reflectors of that love so that others may experience what we have found. We pray for the homeless, especially at this time of year. We pray for the lonely and those who find themselves without hope. Teach us how to include them in our prayers and good works. Lord Jesus, Come soon. Branch of Jesse, we pray about the needs of the world. You gave us a perfect world, and we are the ones who messed it up. Please show us how to reverse the mess we have made with, with regard to the environment and global warming. Help us to be mindful of what we can do to lessen the impact of the negative results which we so often experience. Lord Jesus, come soon. Branch of Jesse, we thank you that we can meet with like-minded people to worship you. Thank you for the church. Where it is an error, please show us how to remedy the situation. We pray for the persecuted church. 
you gave us adequate warning that persecutions will come. But we pray for those who are experiencing those persecutions. We pray that you will strengthen the faith of those who are undergoing any kind of ill treatment. We pray for those who are so misguided that they are inflicting their views on others in a violent way, that you will show them the error of their ways and lead them into life everlasting. Lord Jesus, come, come soon. Branch of Jesse, we pray for the leaders of the nation. It often appears that we, that they and we, are dealing with a tinderbox, and that with one wrong move, there will be a conflagration. We pray about the trouble spots in the world, that those in authority may be able to keep the lid on the problems, so that the people may live in peace. Show us all that what we may do to contribute to a world which more closely resembles the world you have in mind. Lord Jesus, come soon. Branch of Jesse, we pray for this community here at the corner of Avenue Road in DuPont. We thank you for the various outreaches which are taking place. We pray for the Bell Tower Cafe and the people who come to that cafe. We thank you for Vivian and her team, and we pray for them as they seek to serve their clients with love and compassion. We thank you too for the market, and we pray for its effectiveness. We thank you especially for the wonderful concert we experienced on Friday evening, and the contribution made by many people to that, especially Sarah John. Lord, knit us together as a group of parishioners so that others may be attracted by the love we have for one another. Lord Jesus, come, come soon. Branch of Jesse, we pray for Tay and John as they lead us. We pray too for the stewardship campaign and Jen as she leads it. Help us to respond as you desire. Lord Jesus, come, come soon. soon. All these prayers and thanksgiving we offer in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Also with you.
All those who are baptized in any tradition are welcome to receive communion at Christ's holy table. Let us pray. Gracious God, your word to us is food indeed. Receive all we offer you this day, and let your loving kindness be our comfort for the sake of Jesus Christ, King of the universe. Amen. Please gather with me around Christ's table. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing. Always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in Jesus Christ you established your reign of righteousness and peace, giving us partnership in its manifestation and hope for its fulfillment. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Thanks to you, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation. In calling Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. <clears throat> Therefore, Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, your gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we, made acceptable in him, may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new, and bring us to that city of light, where you dwell with all your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. God of promise, you prepare a banquet for us in your kingdom. Happy are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. 
Let us pray. Living God, in the Eucharist, you fill us with new hope. May the power of your love, which we have known in the word and sacraments, may continue your saving work among us and bring us to the joy you promise. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, please be seated for a few uh, announcements. Um, first off, uh, we can't get any further without celebrating the enormous success of the, uh, the Summer Hill <laughs> Quite spectacular on several different levels. Uh, first off, we packed the church to the extent that we had to grab every available chair and put it out. And at a certain point, we had to put a sign on the door saying, No more entry by order of the file marshal. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't fit anybody. And we had to turn people away. Uh, we packed the place, which was fantastic. Um, the level of performance is the second thing that ought to be congratulated. Uh, just an incredibly ambitious repertoire that you pulled off spectacularly well, including uh, a piece that was an original piece that the composer himself was here. I'm sorry, Richard, uh, Richard, Harriet. Richard Harriet was here, and he performed, and he is an amazing piano player as well. And so uh, that was just an incredibly high level of performance, and uh, it was indeed an impressive and, and, and thing. So congratulations on your first concert, and uh, you are thinking towards the next one, I imagine, and that would be roughly... Uh, our next concert is April 6th. Okay. And you're still looking for musicians, right? Yes, looking for mostly string players, but okay. also looking for trombone. Okay, so if you know a violinist or a trombonist, who might, do they call them trombonists? <laughs> Trombone eye? Trombonists. Okay. <laughs> Trombonies. <laughs> Trombonies. Okay. <laughs> you can, you can, you can use a few. So um, please talk to Sarah if you're interested in that. <laughs> Other musical things happening might include. Oh, on December 10th, there's lessons and carols with the choir and some guests. It's going to be candlelight and very holiday, cheerful, and telling stories. What time? 7.30 on next Sunday night. Great. Okay. Uh, wonderful. I'm really looking forward to that, too. Uh, so a couple other things happening. On December 15th, there's an expert of the artist event. And this time, we're doing something completely different. We're having a uh, reggae artist uh, who is apparently pretty well known, and this is his only Toronto performance this year. So uh, we're, again, expecting to have a pretty good turnout. Uh, so uh, if you are interested in music, that music, uh, please do come. If you're not interested, you should come and learn about that culture. <laughs> so anyway, that's happening uh, on the 15th. I'm not sure the time. It's evening, like I think 8 p.m., but anyway, uh, December 15th. Um, what else? Um, Jen, do you want to say some stuff about stewardship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, so, Last week, um, there is a survey that uh, people can fill out. The link was sent out on Friday. We're going to resend it on, on Monday, if that's okay, Sandra. Um, the link will be sent out again. It's also on the website. We only had five people do the survey so far. So, in an expression of love to each other and to this community, I highly encourage you to fill out the survey. And so far, it's taking, on average, six minutes and 20 seconds. So, this isn't a big time commitment. And then uh, we'll be following up on December 17th with a presentation of what we've learned from the survey, um, as well as an opportunity after church to discuss how we move forward with our uh, stated goals as a community. Uh, I've made lasagna. Uh, I know that uh, Diane is bringing some salad and making some greens. Hopefully, bringing some garlic bread and things change for you.
situation. And then that will be basically uh, uh, kind of pretty much the end of our stewardship thing. We're going to wrap it up before Christmas. So, um, you know, then we'll be done with that for, for a little while. And then we're going to be getting into annual report season and all that kind of stuff. So uh, stay tuned. Um, let's see, other, other, other announcements about stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Vivia asked me to remind everyone that on Friday there's Heckin' Craft Time at 16 o'clock, which is what it says on Facebook, um, which is 4 o'clock in Canada. And that's for two hours, and I believe there's a guest artist coming to show us how to do uh, a special Christmas tree ornament. So, Friday afternoon crafts. Okay, Friday afternoon crafts, wonderful. Speaking of, of stuff, uh, we did a lot of Christmas decorating. I shouldn't say we, because I left early, but um, folks did a lot of Christmas decorating and uh, just Advent slash Christmas decorating uh, last week at uh, the service. And it looks like there's a few things left to do. Am I right? So are we going to do? Yes, Andrew. There is a very large wreath that normally goes below the, the stained glass window. It is well decorated, but I need help putting it up. I don't climb ladders. <laughs> so the whole pile of stuff is Yeah, I think it should go there. We just we just need some brave souls to climb ladders. So Jen is on it. Okay, great. Uh, we can, there's also a few other little things that we can help with. There's a big board thing that's behind, over there that needs to get moved somewhere. Yeah, a little few things like that. So we'll uh, we'll do that after the service. After we all have some coffee and, and so forth, and touch with Michael with questions about. Just, like, you know, like, I just want to get more. Yeah. 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 Sure. <laughs> and then, It's a great way to get some handcrafted, really special items for your loved ones and people you don't love. And, and, uh, and I think you need some calls and stuff with the church email and so on about people that want to be vendors. So we're going to have basically a full house of craft people, you know, uh, artisans that created amazing things. So please do, do come for that. Thank you for reminding me about that. Um, other announcements for the congregation? Okay, wonderful. Um, can you come up for a second? So, um, many of you uh, probably have met Daniel. Uh, he joined us uh, this summer. Um, what you probably didn't know is that when he is not with us on Sundays, it's often because he's in the hospital. Um, it's okay if I share a little bit. Yeah, we, we talked about this. But, um, so, Michael is uh, living with cancer. Daniel. 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 What did I say? Michael. Michael. Oh, I said Michael. Sorry. <laughs> Michael's on the break. Daniel. Daniel. Yes. Uh, so, um, uh, Daniel's been living with, with cancer, and um, it looks like he may be going into the hospital soon, uh, and that he might not come out of the hospital. Uh, so he's preparing for uh, a final journey, as it were, and uh, he's come to our community as a place to give him support as he does that. Uh, he does not have family. Um, he's come to us to be his family during this time, and I have to say that I am uh, really honored that you would, you would pick us and, and uh, deeply moved, and I've been thinking since we had our conversation about ways in which our community can be supportive. But one of the things, obviously, that we can do is we can pray for him, uh, especially at this time as he starts to look towards uh, what, will, what will be his end here. Um, he is a Christian. Uh, he lives in hope of the, of the resurrection and the expectation of eternal life with God. And we commend that in him and we, and we um, commend him in his journey. Uh, so we'll talk in the next uh, days and weeks ahead about exactly how we can be supportive, uh, who can go and visit him, and, and so forth. Uh, but to begin with, I think that it's appropriate for us to do our holy huddle as we do here sometimes and anoint him and, and pray for him. So why don't you just uh, come in the middle here. And then uh, as you're able and comfortable, please just kind of surround uh, Daniel here and we will, we will pray for him. Spirit. 
Amen. As you are outwardly anointed with this holy oil, so may our Heavenly Father grant you the inward anointing of the Holy Spirit. Of His great mercy, may He forgive you your sins, release you from suffering, and restore you to wholeness and strength. May He deliver you from all evil, preserve you, Daniel, in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So uh, I think what we'll do, among other things, is uh, organize uh, people to, to visit Daniel uh, once he does go to the hospital. So if you're someone who is available to do that, uh, please let me know, and we'll start to put a list together of folks that can go visit him. Uh, so again, thank you, uh, Daniel, for, for trusting our community, uh, for coming to us, and for asking us to help you with this time. Um, all right. Let us uh, continue by singing our final hymn, if I can find it, which is... 91. Right. Uh, 91. It's on uh, page... Page 13.